Let us pray. God, I pray that you will help me not to get in the way today, that you will let my words and the things that you want us to hear draw us deeper into that relationship with you, that our hearts and our lives will be changed, and that we will go into the world to share that hope that we have found through you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we are continuing our series on Love Breaks Through, and today I'm going to be sharing uh, my story of how I came to Christ, how I became a Christian. And so I'm sharing how love breaks through as a caring friend. And I want you to know today that as you hear uh, the other pastor stories, my story, you have a story as well, that all of our stories matter, how we have met Christ, how we, how we've been changed by Christ, because I could share my story and it might not really fully touch someone, but you might be able to share your story and they might really connect with it. So hearing our stories of what God has done in us, I want you to feel that, that urge, that challenge, that courage from God to share what God has done in your life. Uh, you probably will not have as long, I kind of have a captive audience uh, here this morning But just knowing and being able to share, this is how God has impacted me. This is how God has changed my life is crucial and is important and it matters. And so for my story, I did not grow up going to the church. Uh, I guess you could say my family in a bad way was ahead of the trend, which is kind of uh, familiar today in that I didn't go to church. My parents didn't go to church. Uh, My grandparents didn't go to church. They had went decades uh, before I was born. But most of my family uh, and extended family were not involved in the church. And it was during my second grade year that my, we were living in West Virginia at the time. I was born in Iowa, but my dad had got transferred uh, for work to Parkersburg, West Virginia. And during my second grade year, my dad uh, decided to divorce my mother. And that was really incredibly difficult to deal with uh, because my mother and my baby brother and myself, we ended up moving back to Iowa because that's where uh, my mother's uh, support, family support was. That's where her parents lived. That's where her sisters lived. And so we moved back to Iowa, but that meant... I was going to be 500 miles from my father. And as I said, growing up, I did not uh, go to church. I was not connected with the church. Uh, Those early years uh, after my parents' divorce, a lot of anger, a lot of rage kind of developed in me. And I would say that even at that young age, the, the early elementary years, late elementary, I didn't really believe in God. Or I believed if there was a God, that God didn't really care about me or other people. Or at the worst, maybe God was kind of like that mean kid with the magnifying glass uh, that burns the ants on the ground for you know, God's amusement, that we were kind of just entertainment uh, for God if there was one. So I didn't have a very positive uh, view of God. And as I said, I was dealing with a lot of pain, a lot of anger in my heart, and I did not always express those things in good ways. I was angry at my dad for leaving my mom. I was angry at living with my mother. Uh, Living with my mother, even though at a young age, I quickly realized that, that we were poor. Uh, that we were living in poverty. Uh, You know, you don't really realize that at first as a kid until you realize other people's situations around you. But I realized that we were poor as, you know, we needed food stamps and welfare, even though my mom was working multiple part-time jobs trying to make ends meet. I remember at times worrying if we were going to have enough food that would last to the end of the month. I remember at times we would have peanut butter, but it wouldn't say Jif on the side. 
some of you maybe are familiar with this, but it just had a white, it was like a tub, uh, almost like a Folgers can, and it just said, it was a white label, black block letters that said peanut butter. Um, let me tell you, if you've never tried that peanut butter before, uh, it does not spread on bread. Um, it, it, it comes out in chunks and just stays in chunks and does not spread. But that's what we had. I remember at times having clothes that were probably too old, too tattered. I remember at times where I needed a haircut, but we just didn't have the money to afford that. But I did, even though we didn't have those material things, I knew my mother loved me very much, but I was still filled with a lot of pain, and I just didn't know how to, how to process that. And as I said, I, we did not go to church growing up. The few times that I can remember going to church when I lived with my mother and my young brother was as the years progressed, and when I did something really, really bad, then my mother would bring me to church. Uh, almost like, that's it, you vandalize something, you're going to church, you need Jesus, and so I'm bringing you to church because I just don't know what else to do with you. And so at a young age, late elementary, early junior high, I basically viewed church as something I have to go do if my mom is at her wit's end and doesn't know what else to do with me. And so it was punishment. And so obviously, you're not going to have a really high positive view of church in those circumstances. And so as the time progressed, and I'm in junior high, I continue to make choices that are not, not smart, not good, uh, cause problems for me, cause problems for my family, and I remember during my seventh grade year, uh, my mother got remarried. Now, my dad, he had got remarried pretty quickly uh, after the divorce, which that also made me angry. Uh, but I, my mother got remarried when I was in seventh grade. And my mother married a man that she didn't realize at the time, but was abusive, and especially to his own daughter, and was uh, addicted to drugs. Uh, she, my mom found out that she was, uh, that he was taking her money and buying drugs with it. And my mom, uh, who, uh, she's gone, she's passed, she passed in 2011. Uh, but my mother, when she was alive, was a very strong-willed woman, a very passionate woman, uh, very stubborn. Uh, now you know where I get it from. And so she did everything she could to try to make that situation better. But it was a bad situation. And I remember, even at that young age, I was 13, kind of looking at my choices, my families, my life around me. And even at that young age of 13 years old, I felt like my life was kind of spiraling down a bad path. And so I made the decision at the beginning of my eighth grade year, I made the decision that I was going to go and live with my father, to move 500 miles back to West Virginia, to leave my mother and my younger brother and live with my father. I, I thought if I just had a change in scenery, maybe that would change how I felt, change my circumstances, and when I moved with my dad, and moving in junior high is tough. Uh, and actually, you can even remove that disclaimer and just say junior high is tough, because junior high is tough. Uh, but moving your eighth grade year to a new school, trying to make friends, uh, can be quite challenging. And so I remember moving, and I kind of fell into some of the same bad habits uh, that I did before, where I quickly remembered that if I could just act like a class clown, act up, that some people would find me funny and want to be friends with me. And so that's what I did. And those who didn't think I was funny or got in my way or insulted me, I was quick to get in fistfights with them and get in trouble at school. And so even though I was in this new situation, 
I kind of fell into some of the same traps. And it was kind of an odd thing because with my mother, we struggled with the material things, yet I knew my mother loved me. Yet with my father, we didn't struggle at all with those material things. We had those, but because of my father's background, uh, he had uh, been in foster homes growing up throughout his life. It's a very challenging thing to have to go through. Uh, while he was able to provide those material things, it was very hard for him to communicate uh, emotions or affection because of his upbringing. So it was almost flipped from my mom. And as I said, I went through a lot of challenging situations growing up, but there was a turning point. There was a, a, a catalyst experience that I had that made a difference. And that was I became friends with Jonathan, who goes by John and now, and he lived up the hill for me, and Jonathan was very different than myself. Jonathan was very caring, very kind, compassionate, generous, and all that flowed out of his relationship with Jesus. He was a Christian, and so was his family. But one thing that Jonathan and I had in common was our love of basketball. We would play basketball all the time. It didn't matter, you know, it didn't just have to be sunny, it could be rainy or windy or snowing. We would, even if it was snowing, I remember we would build like a little ramp up uh, to the hoop so, you know, you'd have to travel, but you could travel and jump off the ramp of snow and then dunk it. And so the snow didn't stop us. We played basketball all the time. The thing that would stop us from playing was Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights. That's when John and his family would go to church or when John would go to youth group. And I can remember trying to encourage John not to go to church. You know, one of your pastors now encouraging people not to go to church. And I wasn't very creative, uh, so I called him church boy. Um, like I said, not very creative. And I remember saying to him, come on, church boy. Like, you don't have to go to church all the time. God's not going to smite you if you stop and play basketball with me a little bit longer. Like, come on, man. You don't need to go. And John was faithful. John was like, I, I need to go. I want to go. You're welcome to go with me. But I would, I would laugh at that idea. I would say, I don't need church. I don't need God. And he would go. And the thing I remember, another thing that sticks out to me about John was, even though I believed a lot different than him at that time, it was clear to me that John loved God and that John loved me. That John not only would invite me to church, but he was faithful in living out uh, his faith in his life. Uh, and John would also share with me why he went to church why he followed God, why that was important to him. And he did it in kind and compassionate ways. And it reminds me that caring friends change lives when they embody God's love. If you take anything with you today, take that. That caring friends change lives when they embody God's love. It reminded me of our story that, that Teresa read for us today. And that is that story with Philip and Nathaniel. How Philip encountered Jesus and he went back. And he was changed and he went back and he found Nathaniel. And he went to Nathaniel and said, hey, you've got to come see this. You've got to encounter, you've got to meet Jesus. He's who we've been waiting for. And so Jonathan kind of reminded me of Philip, and I kind of reminded myself of Nathaniel with the skepticism where Nathaniel was kind of like, eh, I don't know about all that. I, I, Jesus from Nazareth, you know, did anything good ever come from there? And so for me, it reminded me of Nathaniel where my friend was kind and compassionate, generous, gracious to me, would, would invite me to church and tell me about Jesus, and I was still kind of like, I, I don't know. And then it was during my ninth grade year, the middle of the year, and my friend John invited me to a Super Bowl party. Now, this is where 
Uh, and you know, this was before everyone had like big screen TVs and, and things. So it was, you know, it was a big drawing point uh, for the youth group. And so I remember John invited me to a Super Bowl party and I say he tricked me. He says he didn't. But I remember John inviting me to the Super Bowl party and I thought, sure, football, you know, party, food, count me in. And, and I remember as the Super Bowl party came, asking, well, where is this at? Where are we going? And he told me we were going to his church, uh, going to his youth group's Super Bowl party. And I thought, you, you tricked me, man. Like, that's not right. And, and so I started making jokes and saying, are we going to have to sing Kumbaya at halftime? You know, are, are we going to have to pray after each quarter? Uh, are we going to have to baptize the nachos? You know, like, what's, what's going to happen here? Because really, I didn't have a clue about the church. I didn't know who Noah was or Moses or, or Jesus or any of that kind of stuff. And so, he, you know, being the, the caring friend that John was, uh, he said, dude, just shut up and uh, just come, have a good time, check it out. And so I went. And I went and I was kind of like Nathaniel, where I was skeptical. I went and I wanted to see how did these people treat each other? You know, did they treat people the same way I did? Or were they kind to each other? Were they compassionate? Were they loving towards one another? And I also wondered, would they accept me? Because I was um, dead set on, I'm not going to go there and act one way that's not consistent with who I am. I'm going to go there in all my flawedness. <laughs> and not change who I was. And so I wanted to see how they would treat me. And I guess it was an amazing experience because I went there and like I said, it was a lot of teens and you know, of course they joked around and laughed and poked fun at each other and did all that. But I could tell they cared about each other. I could tell they loved each other. I could tell they mattered to each other. And then I could also tell that they accepted me. That even though I, I wasn't from their church, I wasn't a part of their youth group at that time, I could tell that I was welcome. Flaws and all. So I remember going home and kind of, uh, it threw me for a loop a little bit because it wasn't what I perceived the church would be like. And I remember my friend John for the next few months inviting me to go back go back to, to church with him, and I didn't make fun of him anymore, but I just kind of said, nah, no, nah, I'm just not going to go this time. I'm not going to go. Then finally, near the end of my ninth grade year, he invited me to go with him to their Sunday night youth program. Now, you got to remember, mid-90s. Uh, so he invited me to go with him to their Sunday night program called Sunday Night Extreme, you know, because everything had to be extreme or rad or whatever during the 90s. And so we went, and I agreed to go with him. And I remember we, we played some games. I remember we, we sang some, some songs. At that time, we didn't have, like, the cool PowerPoints. It was like the, the little projector with the clear screens with the, the words written on them, and you would have to change the the slide like that. And I remember we stood to sing those songs, and I didn't sing. I stood with everyone else, but I didn't sing because I was like, I don't know these words. I don't really know if I believe any of this stuff. And so I stood there. And then I remember when they got to the message. <clears throat> when they got to the message, when the youth pastor, Wes, was getting ready to stand up and to speak, I remember telling my friend John that, uh, that I was just going to go outside. You know, during this part, I'm just going to go outside. Uh, just come and get me when this, you know, just come and get me when this part's over. And John was like, dude, just stay. Just stay. Hear what Wes has to share. Just listen to the message. So I agreed, and, and I stayed. And, and maybe I heard this message before, but I, I, I couldn't remember it. But it was the first time that I could remember hearing that God not only made me, but he loved me. That God not only made the world, but he loved the world, and he wanted the world to be back in that right relationship with God. 
that he wanted to forgive us of our sins and to give us new life in Christ. I didn't know that. I hadn't heard that before. I, th- I thought, I didn't even know if God was around, let alone cared about me, loved me. So I remember that night I, I gave my life to Christ. I chose to follow Jesus. And since that time, God has continue, had been continuing to work in my life. I, I do remember, even after I gave my life to Jesus, I remember the first couple months telling my friend John, like, well, I might be a Christian, but I'm not getting up early on Sunday morning to go to church. Um, so I'll go Sunday nights, that's it. Uh, so that's your pastor once again, you know, you know, prime, like right there. But that's where I was, and God continued to mold me and shape my, my life. But I truly believe this. I truly believe that if John hadn't been that caring friend that embodied God's love, I don't know if I ever would have became a Christian. I don't know if I ever would have stepped in those doors of his church. And this church was, uh, it was, if not the largest, one of the largest churches in that, that area. I mean, we had 1,400, 1,500 people in worship, uh, they had big facilities, lots of programs, all that kind of stuff, but, but none of those things drew me in the doors. None of those things got me through those doors. The first thing that got me through those doors was a caring friend, someone who followed Christ, loved God, and was willing to invite me and share with me why Jesus mattered to him. That's what got me through those doors. And then when I did come through those doors, I had a positive experience. The other people that were there welcomed me, accepted me. And that enabled me to hear that message that Jesus loved me. So my friends, as I prepare to wrap things up, you know, I always like us to ask, what does this, what does this matter to us today? What does God want us to hear And the first thing I think God wants us to hear is this. If you are here and you've never heard this before, please hear today that God made you, that God loves you, and dearly desires to be in a relationship with you. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you are, how many times you've messed up, Jesus is there waiting with open arms to say, come home. I made you, I love you, I want to be in a relationship with you. If you've already accepted that gracious gift, secondly, I believe God wants us to grow in our faith, to be those people that embodies God's love. It reminds me of Philippians chapter one, verse nine through 11, where the apostle Paul is talking to the Philippian church and he's telling them that he wants to see them grow into the fullness of Christ that he doesn't want them just to have a little bit of Jesus or partially experience God, but he wants them to fully experience Christ. And I believe that's what God wants for us as well, to not just know about Jesus, but to know Jesus. Not just to have a little bit of Jesus, but to be fully transformed by Jesus, to where we embody God's love, to where then we can go into the world and we can share that hope we have with the world. As 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 tells us that we should always be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have and to do so with gentleness and respect. May we be transformed by God's love. May we go into the world sharing and being ready to share that hope we have in Christ. Because my friends, I truly believe that if we do that, if we accept this gracious gift of God, of salvation, of new life in him, that if we grow in our faith, that if we then embody God's love and go into the world and we share that with others, we'll change our church. We'll change our community. We'll change our world. We just have to be willing to seek Christ. Let God transform us. And that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect all the time. I mess up plenty. My wife can attest to that. (laughs) Doesn't mean we're going to be perfect all the time. 
It doesn't mean we're always going to have the answers, but it means that we can seek Christ, we can be changed by Christ, and we can share that hope with the world. May you be that caring friend that embodies God's love to others. Amen.